Good afternoon. Welcome to our Monastery Leadership Forum. I'm Kathy Leach, and on behalf of the Monastery Foundation and the International Monastery Council, I'll be your host today with our very special guest. But before we get to that, uh, just a little reminder at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat button. If you click on that, we always have a lively chat going. So if you have questions, comments, suggestions, you can use the chat. Um, otherwise, feel free to raise your hand and uh, let's see, Zoom has put it under the reaction buttons now where you can click on that little heart and uh, let's see if I can do it. Just raise your hand, you pop up to the top of the screen and then we can um, let you know that you can unmute and participate, ask any questions. We expect to have a lively conversation. So get ready to think about our elementary curriculum because Today's guest, Dr. Robin Howe, is going to introduce us to, can you teach it? You can teach it all, so they say. So I think Robin's going to have some things to say about that. Um, Robin is senior consultant with the Monterey Foundation, has worked with us for many years, former head of school at the Newgate School in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, let's see, Robin, probably a few other uh, talents and things. You've been working with Sarasota University, Bridgemont Academy, and and I'm sure a few other things on the side. So you can fill us in on anything else I've missed, but I'm very happy to have you here with us today. Oh, well, thank you, Kathy. Good to see you all. Hi, Cheryl. I haven't said hello yet. Hi, good to see you. And the rest of you who I don't know well, nice to see you all as well. Um, yeah, so I think that today's topic, what I was asked to talk about is a, one, talk about a course, but more than actually talking about the course, talk about the content of the course, um, as it relates to you all. And I, th I think that most people here are heads of school or school administrators. And so I think what we want to talk about is just the bigger subject of how one, how a elementary practitioner fits it all in. We know that, or maybe you don't know, but we all know, those of us who are elementary uh, Montessorians or have been around elementary Montessorians, uh, know that the curriculum is incredibly vast. And the reality is over a three or six year course of study, it's impossible to get it all in. You know, when, when I'm working with teachers that are just finishing training or even in training, you know, they, you know, they have these thick albums with hundreds of lessons and they're asking themselves the question, okay, how am I going to do that? One of the things that I say to them, you know, right off the bat is you need to be realistic and it doesn't matter how well, you know, all the lessons, if it's not logistically possible to deliver. And that's, and so that's an important piece. If it's not logistically possible to deliver, it doesn't matter. And the other piece of that is if you are trying to get all of this in and you make yourself crazy doing it and then you burn out and you only make it through half the year, then that's also falls into the, the, uh, the bucket of not logistically possible. And so, um, so there, so there's, there's sort of the premise of what this course you can teach it all uh, really talks about is how do you not try to fit it all in, but how do you manage? And I think that's a more appropriate question. How do you manage the elementary curriculum? How do you determine what are sort of the key components you have to teach while also saying, I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to get everything in. And also a question that, and we can talk about any of these pieces you all decide you want to talk to. The other piece is when we're trying to fit all of these things in, where are we including and all giving time for student-led or student interests? And that's another key piece. When we're trying to, you know, again, thinking about this, I mean, literally the entirety of human or the entirety of existence as we know it, where do we allow children to explore their own interests? And so what the course You Can Teach It All really focuses on is how to, how to do that. And so again, determining what's important, how to get on a schedule for you as a practitioner, how to get on a schedule so that way you're working your way through the curriculum once you've determined what it is. How do you give, you know, realistic follow-up work and feedback to students? So that's another important piece is, you know, so many Montessori teachers, and I wouldn't say this is exclusive to elementary, but when they're so focused, excuse me, so focused on giving lessons, they give the lesson, but they don't actually leave in time to evaluate how students are understanding. And so again, that cor the course talks about when you give a lesson based on that schedule that follows a, a bigger understanding of the scope and, scope and sequence, how do we assign work that's meaningful to students with choice, 
that they can do that then we as, again, the practitioner can logistically go back and, and evaluate to give feedback. But at the very least, we know that they're learning because that's the other key piece to this vastness of the elementary curriculum is we're often so consumed with trying to get it in that we never actually fit. We'd never take the time, or not never, but we often don't take the time to figure out, are they learning? And ask ourselves as practitioners, what does it mean to be learning? Because again, I'd also suggest that it's different based on the area of curriculum. So a hard skill, like a, a skill in math, how you how you demonstrate learning. Hey, Lisa, I think that's you. It is Lisa. It is Lisa. That how you demonstrate mastery or learning in math may be different than something that's a little more open-ended, for example, than understanding what it means for organisms to evolve, right? So there's some hard skills and then there's some do, some other big pictures. So, so the course You Can Teach It All really focuses on those key things and is meant to give strategies so that you don't drive yourself crazy working through the curriculum. So. Robin, I wonder, um, because there's a couple things that come to mind when we think about this. Well, first of all, I'd like to take a moment and just put our, our hearts and our energy towards our gratitude for Dr. Michael Dorr for developing this course and the system that goes along with it. Um, Michael has, um, prior to his death, given permission for us to continue. And Robin had worked with him for a number, actually very many years in developing these systems and, and working together alongside Michael and presenting a lot of this work. So we wanna honor that history and that legacy that um, Michael had provided for us. But I, I think of two different things, Robin. I think, first of all, from a head of school's perspective and or curriculum directors, coaches, things like that, people like that that are faced with teachers who come to them and either um, don't want to be vulnerable. Yes, I do it all. I got everything there. You know, don't look um, because they're a little nervous about what might be missing. Right. And then you also then have the parent pressure of yeah, it's all well and good that they're doing these timelines, but that what's that really going to do, right? I don't like that my child's not doing ABC, whatever it is that the parent um, has in mind that there is their priority. So when you think about the, you know, how do you look at the pressures from two different angles, the, the supervisor of the classroom of the teacher and the parental pressure that they deal with in this teach it all or teach what I want you to teach when I want you to teach it. Well, I mean, I think that it starts with having realistic expectations that are shared first. We'll talk about the administrators shared by the teacher and the administrator, right? So if, you know, and it, that doesn't have to be super granular in all the details, but like, is it, you know, we, we can assume that yes, by the time they finish an elementary program, they need to know how to do basic things like read and write, but a little more detail. Okay. They need to be uh, uh, proficient readers and they need to be able to write and, and sort of clarifying what those basic expectations are. So that way, you know, if you're, if you as the practitioner and your administrator are on the same page, theoretically, if a parent is not comfortable with what you're doing, at least you have the support of your administrator. So I think that's one thing, having clear, if not super specific, clear expectations that are shared among the school. Now, the other challenge, you know, and then I'll just sort of acknowledge is often these schools have multiple different, um, you know, like if you have three upper elementary classes, for example, you may have three teachers doing entirely different things. And so a way that schools ought to be doing this again, even if it's not, you don't have the time to make sure they're all on the same page, get enough on the same page. So you're not teaching three entirely different things. And so one expectation, you know, is, Diff entirely different from another because you'll see often in elementary some teachers are very much into this idea of self-exploration and allowing so much choice that they well we never really got to reading or multiplication because they were doing that you know which is sweet but as children get older in our programs we know that then the, the pressure changes and so we need to figure out what 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 we're sort of doing and that needs to be a shared goal amongst the administrators and the teachers. And once you have that piece, Kathy, to your question about how do you manage the pressure of parents, again, trying to be as clear as possible with the parents about what you're gonna do. You know, for example, if you have a parent that comes in and says, well, my sixth grader, um, my sixth grader, his friend 
our neighbor is in double accelerated math at the magnet school here, you know, we want to be able to say, well, that's great, but here's what we do. And again, you're not going to be able to explain to a parent, you know, the entire scope and sequence of the math curriculum or every other area of curriculum. But generally speaking, you want to be able to say, you know, by the time they finish, finish our program, here's what our expectations are. Here's how we're evaluating against it and just trying to be clear. And then sometimes, you know, especially as parents get older, it may be that that's not good enough for them, that they may just have needs that exceed <laughs> what we're able to deliver. And, and that's, as, as, you know, I, I know a lot of people probably don't like that response, but if you have a parent of a student that's. I'll call them a high needs parent and they want to know reporting every single day, what they did and every single skill. And that's not generally how we do things. And so it may be that that's just what they need. And, and they need to go to that double accelerated math program where, you know, as soon as that kid does the test, it's in a book and they can go look. Well, I'm really glad that you distinguish between the student's need and the parent's need. Okay. Because really the student may not need that, but the parent may need that. And part of that is us coming to grips with, we can't be everything to everyone. And this is really the root of my question, Robin, because I think so often what I hear, and I, I'm sure you do too, um, our parents make us do this, right? We do We know that it's not really right. And we know it's not so great for our students. And we know it's not really Montessori, but the parents really like this. And so I really appreciate that you say it's okay to say this is who we are and what we do. This is how it serves your student. And if that doesn't meet your needs as a parent, fly little birdie fly, right? <laughs> because we have to stay true to what we know is right for our schools and for our students. Yeah, and 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 that's I mean again, I'll I'll, I'll share a term that some of you might have heard before. I love it. And I, I think I'm responsible for it. So maybe I'm, I'm mutually exclusive dual wants. You may have oh, these. Goodness. Say that again. Let's get that for the recording. Mutually exclusive dual wants. So like, again, this is just something that came up organically probably 10, 15 years ago, but it's, it's that parent that started with us when their child was 18 months. Right. And they love Montessori. They love that we're child honoring. They love that their children have choice. And they love everything about Montessori and they're out there doing everything, right? They're they're that parent. And then their kid, you know, goes through the primary program and then we're still good, you know, because it's, but now we're entering those elementary years, you know, okay, cool. So I'm, I love Montessori, you know, you know, I'm in it because I, I have these five years of history with the school, but I'm, I'm starting to get concerned about the education. Like what about, re, when does real school start, Right. And I'm sure we've all had that parent, right? That they demonstrate that they love us. We know they love us, but in the back of their head, because they're trad traditionally educated, they're starting to feel that concern and pressure that if they continue in our Montessori programs that look different, that their child's not going to be adequately prepared. And so what we can do is we can try to educate them as best we can. We can share with them the expectations of, you know, what we can and can't do when things come up that we can address as administrators, we address them. I mean, like, Lisa, can I can I pick on you for a second? Yeah, I mean, so I've worked with Lisa and her and one of her children, and a you know the, over the course of the years, but in particular one year we had a challenge, and it was some it was some personality stuff and a couple other things, but we 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 met, we talked about it, and we addressed it, and that was something that was manageable within our scope of being able to manage. Now, if Lisa came to me and said, you know what, I need you to you know, uh, teach teach them calculus when they're in seventh grade and because that's what my expectation and I need a daily report of every single thing they're doing, then I would have had to say, that's, I acknowledge that's what you need, but it's just not realistic and we can't do that for so many students. And that's also not in alignment with what we're trying to do for our students. Mm -hmm. And so, so you have to sort of, you have to sort of recognize what they need. And again, that idea of mutually exclusive dual wants means they want all the good parts about Montessori, but as their kids get older, that piece creeps in that they can't ignore that says, are they going to be ready? And even worse than, are they going to be ready? I'd say guilt often, guilt often sort of starts creeping in and they start asking the question, not only are they going to be ready, but the opposite side of that is, am I doing a disservice? Am I putting them at a disadvantage to keeping them in this school as they get older. And so that's why really 
being clear on what we're trying to accomplish as a school, what we're going to deliver, even if it's general, if we're clear on that, we can share that with them and let them make the decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, it does. And I, you know, it just brings me back to how essential it is that we're proactive in preparing the parents for what we do and be honest and forthright right from the beginning. I think the clearer we are about what we offer, what we can and can't do really does help. And then they can get excited about that elementary curriculum. But I can understand a parent thinking, you know, well, I had to memorize my math facts. Why aren't they coming home with flashcards every day? And maybe some shows students will need that and maybe that that's all well and good, but not every student's going to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, but when you have a mindset, if we haven't prepared them, I think it's harder to do this. And I know I'm getting a little off topic, but I do think the parent piece is a, is a big part of oh. it. As well. Well, okay, yeah, well, I obviously agree, but the other part of this, and I'm, again, I'm not going to speak for, every elementary Montessori educator, but the other part is, and I'm going to tie this back in a little bit with what the course talks about is because it's so vast, right? The elementary curriculum, a lot of, you know, people very, I'll call it organically have a plan. Like today we're going to do this and, you know, we're going to give this lesson Monday and then we're going to give another lesson on Thursday. And they don't really have a system in place to keep them, keep them on track. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, and, you know, they say that, you know, I'm going to do another homage to, to Michael Dore. And they say, well, I'm following the child. So, you know, this week they didn't need a math lesson, right? And I'm like, okay, but you add this week to next week because you're following the child, which I'm going to come back to. And then all of a sudden you're halfway through the school year and you haven't given a math lesson. And then your children really are, your students really are, you know, at, uh, you know, not going to learn. And so one of the things that Dr. Dore suggested is really helpful for students, but also helpful for teachers is getting on a schedule that you're, okay, I'm going to be giving these lessons and I know that I'm going to do it at this certain time. And that's going to essentially keep me honest. And it's also going to help these students as they're developing a sense of order. And also when you're assigning follow-up work, help them develop a sense of here's what my responsibility is and here's when I have to get it done. And that will help sort of pro help you progress through the curriculum. So that way you're not just, you know, organically saying do whatever you want, mm -hmm. but does anybody here, and again, this is what Michael, this is a story Michael told me, and I'm going to mention it. And again, it's a little off, off topic too, but the story of uh, Follow the Child. I think we're waiting to hear it from you, even if- Okay, so again, I have not fact-checked this and, and I was not old enough, but we were talking about that catchphrase that Montessorians use. And again, probably not, not a popular topic here, but I'm going to say it anyways, because why not? Whenever we, whenever, whenever we want a reason for doing something, Montessorians, I mean, many Montessorians, we say, well, we're just following the child, right? And okay, and that's sort of like our get out of jail free card. Like, oh, why didn't you give them a lesson? Or why didn't you focus on writing? Oh, because I'm following the child. So what Michael suggested, or what Michael shared, and I, I do believe Michael, because I think that Michael was probably one of the smartest men I've ever met, and certainly my Montessori mentor. And um, he said that that phrase came up when Dr. Montessori was in India uh, during exile in the Second World War. And a uh, an Indian parent was walking with their toddler, and uh, you know, Dr. Montessori suggested, you know, again, my telling of Michael's story is that Dr. Montessori suggested, why don't you let your child walk? To which the parent said, well, my child may fall. And then to which Montessori said, well, follow your child. Essentially saying, be there to pick them up if they fall. I mean, don't let them, you know, obviously we don't want our children to fall off a cliff or walk off a cliff, but we're, we want to let them tumble because that's how they, that's how they learn. And the reason I bring that up is because um, I think it's an important concept in Montessori, but I think what a lot of Montessorians do again, as I said, is they, they use that term to rationalize essentially anything that they allow to do. And I don't think that's how it was meant. And so I just thought I'd bring that up, but, um, um, but yeah, so that that was a story, and I was I was going to make a point, come back to that, and I I lost train of that where where I was going with that. Well, where, Robin, I'll I, help you because Lisa shares with us a very important point that she's using her her alumni, her kids who were in her elementary program, to come back and talk to parents mm -hmm. and elementary you know prospects, and I think that um, 
I have seen it over and over again that when element, when middle school and high school kids who were in a Montessori elementary classroom come back and talk about their experience, that really alleviates some of what you're talking about, Robin, that stress, that tension that the parent has. Am I doing a service or disservice? Are they going to get enough? Are they prepared? Prepared for what? You know, um, so... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I just saw that. Obviously, I'm not paying too close of attention to the chat, but no, you don't have to. That's what oh, I. Good. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of having an adolescent program and a high school program. You know, mm -hmm. is a lot of these. You know, the apprehension that that parents feel about elementary children when they see what the product is, it alleviates some of that stress um, because they know, okay, my kid. You know, like talking about a high school, if, if you're in an elementary program and they can see a high school program, they see that these high school kids that went through the very same thing that their children are going through, that looked different than what they grew up with, that they're getting into not only good colleges, but the right college. And more importantly, they're making decisions about why they want to go to college, you know, why they want to go to college, which college is the right college. I always talk about the example of, um, you know, students when they're getting ready to go to college and they arbitrarily say, I want to go to Harvard. And I'm to which I say, cool, that's great. Why? And when the response is because it's Harvard, then we, then we leads down another conversation or I want to go to Michigan, you know, university of Michigan, because we're in Michigan. I'd be like, cool. Um, why? And they say, well, I really like their football team. And I say, Oh, great. Are you, a, are you a football player? Are you going to be on the team? Well, no, I, I want to go there. It's okay. So what do you want to do? Well, I want to be a, a marine biologist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then a question I might ask is, okay, so you're living, you're living in Florida. You're eligible for free college at a state institution, one of which has the best marine biology program in the world, in the country. And so you can get out of that without student loans, without whatever. So let's talk through why you're making these decisions. And again, it's up to you. But I want our students to make informed decisions. And so when these elementary students and these parents of elementary students can see that these young men and women are actually making informed, good decisions and that they're capable of getting into the schools, whether it's Harvard or Michigan, that usually alleviates a lot of stress. Um, but the, the, the reality is many of us don't have access to Montessori middle schools and high schools. So what do you do? You got to be clear on what they're going to get, articulate it to your parents. And I'd say the other thing is, you know, when you're going through admissions and it's if it's somebody that's starting with you new and they're starting with a fourth grader or a fifth grader, again, being very clear that they're not going to get the type of um, reporting that they may be used to and that what learning looks like is different for us. And we evaluate learning differently than many other schools. You know, one of the things that um evaluate, you know, Robin, that's a really important point, too, because you talked about teachers giving a variety of lessons, but being on, you know, on a pace that does not allow them to check for understanding and assess uh, where the student is in this area. And a lot of times our, our um, you know, one of the myths about Montessori, shall I say, is that we don't assess student learning. And I think that's, you know, it, I, I think it came up, maybe it came out of the, the years where all the Montessori schools, really, when I first came into Montessori, it was common, and this is going back 45 years ago, it was common not to give standardized tests, right? Common not to. Now it's those things have shifted, but standardized tests aren't the only form of assessment. And helping parents understand the real, you know, a little different ways to assess and how we do check for understanding and progress and learning. Those are really important pieces. And how do you have teachers have enough time to to do that and not go on to the next lesson and have their list of 20 lessons they're going to give today. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll use a practical example because maybe that's helpful for this forum and for people recording that will be explained in more detail uh, in the in the course is what Michael suggested. And, and those of you who don't know, so actually I met Michael many years ago when my Montessori journey started, which is a great story, but actually I'll, I'll do it in 10 seconds. I was helping get, I was helping get, get ready, get at, a, at one of the Monastery Foundation conferences. And Michael, this older man at the time, but not that old, uh, I must have been 20 years old. So 20 some years ago, he says, I need, I really need orange sticks. And 
how many of you actually know what an orange stick is? Okay. Lisa, you had do you to know have one in our training. Well, I had no idea what an orange stick was. This is before I did my elementary training. An orange stick is a little wooden stick that you use to push back your cuticles. And so, I mean, I literally say to this guy, anyway, this, the, the moral of the story, I went back to this room, I'm like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, well, you, I mean, anyway, but I, the, the other part of the thing is, so Michael, I've known Michael a long time. Michael, I went to Michael's elementary training at St. Catherine's University. He literally was my Montessori trainer. And so one of the things that he was really into and still continued to be, which eventually gave birth to the course you can teach it all, was this idea that you get on a schedule and you start your, you know, to get on a schedule, what that means is you know what your lesson is, you know what your learning objective is, right? So again, it's almost like a direct name. I like using the word learning objective because I feel like it's more inclusive to collective education, um, learning objective. What is your higher order thinking question? So I'm going into, every time I go into a lesson, whether I'm talking about, you know, early humans and what, uh, you know, what came first, the harnessing of fire or collecting fire or whatever, but going into those lessons with a higher order thinking question or two to engage them, then your options for follow-up work, but going into a lesson, having all of that pre-planned. So that's one important thing that, that Michael talked about. So, so you're not going into a lesson and just saying, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of wing it, which again, is I think an, a th another thing a lot of Montessorians do is they, they go in there and it's sort of organic and, and that's really sweet, but it also doesn't, it, 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 it may mean that you don't accomplish what you go in there to accomplish. So having those key components and the other thing that he suggested, which is a really important of this important part of the part of what we're talking about is getting on a schedule that basically you give three lessons a day. And here's one of the things, Kathy, I was talking about where I, I disagree a little bit, or I think that there's options for modification. But if you have three lessons a day, if you're in a, in a class that has three age groups, you give a, and you wouldn't call it first, second, third, or fourth, fifth, sixth, alpha, beta, gamma, right? Whatever you want to call it, three different groups. And you give your math lessons every Monday. So the students start learning that, okay, I'm going to have my math lesson on Monday. At the end of that math lesson, I'm going to be dismissed with my with a clear understanding of what my options are for follow-up work. So you still have choice. And then you have a week to essentially choose how to practice and or complete. And then you know that next Monday, you know, when you return to that lesson, you should have finished with that week's follow-up work. Now, of course, during that week, you may have another another you know review lesson with that student you may give options for working together but what he talked about was basically getting on a schedule so you can say all right i know i'm going to give these lessons over the course of the week so that i can ensure that i'm working my way through the curriculum and so that sounds pretty that sounds pretty strict i mean i think that some people would say no that doesn't make sense and that doesn't allow for creativity and um and one of the things that i always talk about is that you know, there are going to be things that happen that you don't get to those lessons, but but more or less, it's a framework for getting through curriculum. And it also, I think, is really helpful for students that need that, that structure. And again, I know a lot of people don't like to use the word structure, but it really is quite structured. They need to know that, okay, I have a week to get through things and I can plan my day because I know that my lesson is going to be at this time. And it just gives additional additional again, structure so that they can start understanding what's expected. And especially as many of them transition into middle school programs, they're going to be met in many cases with more structure. So I think, you, I really think it's a valuable tool for Montessorians to use. So I'd love to hear from um, any of our elementary teachers or leaders who are on today to hear, you know, have you tried this sort of structure? Have you had success with things like this? Or does it sound really foreign? I mean, to me, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> being early childhood in my sensitive period, I stay eternally in my sensitive period for order and structure. And so I, I appreciate that kind of structure. But at the same time, I always want student choice. And I, you know, I've heard Michael and Robin talk about this for a long time. I think not just student choice that were adult designed. Where does the where does the student part of that come in? And we'll layer that in, but I'd like to know from people on, you know, how, how are you 
feeling about this can kind I, of uh, template and structure for life. Can I add one thing real quick? Oh, well, I should go, go ahead and answer it. I just don't want to forget it. So what was it? Who was asking the question? I couldn't tell who that was. Oh, I'm happy to say something if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Becky, okay. Becky um, asked the question. Oh, sorry. Becky, no, uh, go ahead. Yeah. She asked, what is the minimum presentations that you can present to children per day? So I think the question was, you're giving three lessons a day, but how many lessons do the child, does the each child receive in a day? Do they receive three lessons, four, you know, how many in your, in your framework, Robin? Well, again, and remember that they're going to be days that are abnormal and they're going to be, you know, days where you're doing a group lesson and then individual lessons. So this is again, a framework. And so I want you to hear it, yeah. but not feel like you have to live by it. It's, it's literally just like keeping you moving forward. So using the model that Michael suggests, you have, you basically give three lessons a day and you give one lesson to each of your three groups. If it's a three-year cycle, two things I want to add real quick before we go on. And these are, there's some things with Michael that I didn't necessarily agree with hundred percent, but it just opened for interpretation. So Michael, the way that Michael suggested doing things is you do it by grade. Okay. So not skill-based, but grade-based. And the rationale behind that was based on research that has been published. It suggested that doing skill-based grouping was actually less effective than age grade. Great. So that was his rationale. So regardless of, you know, where you are and, you know, uh, well, I'm going to say that I'll, I'll use geometry, for example, you know, regardless of what you've, what skills you've mastered, all of our fourth graders would get exposed to that same lesson. Again, they'd have options for follow-up work that may be more in tune with their skill set or their interests. But that was that was his thought. Now, I believe that there's some there's definitely merit to that, but I also think that certain things, you know, like math, I'll say math is the one that I find most uh, readily available or most relevant is like I had a hard time, even though I was getting trained to do it this way to have a sixth grader if they, for whatever reason, are so far behind that, you know, they could not, you know, they could not find the volume of a sphere because they just don't have the basic skills to do the mathematics. So I would, I, I, I would sort of tend to go towards skill-based, but then in discussion with them, one of the things we talked about is what are they going to, what are we trying to get from them lesson? Are we trying to get them to be able to calculate the volume of a sphere or is it equally important that they understand the concept of volume and what a sphere is, even if they can't calculate it? So again, it's thinking about, you know, I think that there's some some variation of how you might do your grouping. And then there are other areas that I think are much more um, like, like the cultural studies. You can have a, a cultural lesson that would apply to everybody because you're not really asking them to demonstrate a skill in some sense. You're you're giving an impression impressionistic lesson, and so if your goal is you really want them to think about, you know, for example, evolution, right? Like, I don't necessarily need them to remember the lineage, but what I do want them to take away is that evolution really is a series of successful mutations. So again, that's you know knowing how to do the skill of calculating volume. And also just being able to internalize what evolution are two different things. So I think that there's some lessons that lend themselves to different types of groupings. And um, and so that's just one thing I wanted to add when you're trying to think about how to structure lessons. <clears throat> Timothy shares in the chat that he's a Montessorian, former homeschool dad, a special ed teacher, and a dyslexia interventionist. And um, he shares that what's really important to promote independence in learning is to foster reading and math skills as priority and his word yeah. is paramount. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Timothy, for sharing that. And Lisa shares that it helped her elementary guides when she took the course, um, who may want to retake it with Robin, um, and just texted her. So we've got alumni to talk about it and how it helped them in the classroom. And then of course, thank you, Christine also brings up the, you know, homogeneous, heterogeneous, skill-based learning. How do we group? And um, we also always have to be cognizant of the groups with differentiated learning with, um, I mean, I've talked to hundreds of 
teachers who were trained years and years ago for gifted and talented children. And to Robin, your point, the, the reverse is true. What do you do with a seven-year-old who's able to do algebra just because they were born knowing it? Um, you know, <laughs> where do you put them? Do you really put them in a first grade kind of learning structure? So um, thank you, Christine, for helping us identify all of that. I think when you read these um, chat suggestions and awarenesses, Robin, the heart of this course is to dispel the anxiety of taking mounds and mounds of curriculum and giving the practitioner mm -hmm. and the administrator who's working with them the confidence to get into the classroom with children, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. And again, like what I talked about earlier, just you know, trying to give them a basic structure so that they know, okay, here's over the course of these three years or six years, I'm not going to get through, you know, 148 albums or 148 different lessons in math. But here I know that I'm going to have, you know, the bottom line of the basics, I'm going to accomplish my basic goals that I have articulated that I understand. And that is not the same thing as getting through every single lesson. And so basically just clarifying what your goals are and coming up with a plan that's organized to get through it. And and I and I think the other thing is it's going to change from year to year based on your student population, based on what's going on. And you know again my bigger thing for this course is trying to help teachers like not feel the pressure to get through everything because it really is overwhelming and I think that that's why we're seeing so much well I think that that's why we're seeing so much burnout not just in Montessori teachers but in teachers period is because we're trying to put these unrealistic expectations on ourselves and you can't do it. Trying to fit too much in. And you know, the, the beauty of the elementary curriculum, well, all of the curriculums, I think at every level they have, there's this re built in redundancy and because repetition is important and learning from different perspectives is important. But that redundancy, if we tried to teach every single lesson, I, we'd have students who were bored. Like I already got that on the, you know, the third time I had that last week, why am I doing this one, right? So right. also understanding that this assessment piece that I keep coming back to is once we've observed and actually seen that the student, you know, we, we've had the student be able to produce evidence of learning, right? We've been able mm -hmm. to see that there's actual learning here. Once we can see that we can move on, right? We don't have to do the parallel activities. And I still, mm -hmm. I think that that's part of it. So the redundancy piece, I think is, and we don't, we can't underestimate the connections the students are making that we don't see from this activity to that mm -hmm. activity. They have acquired the knowledge, internalized the knowledge and don't need every single lesson. Um, actually you brought it again, because I want to, I want to sort of tackle some tiny bits of the courses. So a lot of what I'm talking about is flushed out much more in the course, but um the other, one of the things we talk about is the importance of follow-up work, especially at the elementary level. And so one area where, again, I, I'm going to say I've seen this based on you know my working with other students, uh, schools, is a lot of teachers will, again, go into some lessons without, without an understanding of what their learning objective or direct aim is. So they'll go into a lesson, and then they'll mm -hmm. finish the lesson, and it may even be a great lesson. Or maybe they're talking through something, and it's, and it's um, really inspired and whatever. And then at the end of the lesson, they say something like, and now I want you to leave the lesson. I want you to choose something because we love the word choice in Montessori. I want you to choose something that shows me you understand this, right? Which is lovely. But for many students, like, like if you, if I said to you all, do something to demonstrate you understand something, there's, it's so vast that the work then becomes choosing what to do. And they don't actually get to practicing the skill because they're so like they're they're trying to figure it out. So one of the things that we talk about is the importance of going into a lesson with one or two, you know, options for follow-up work. And what that may mean is, and I, I think that it's really helpful to be specific. So it's not saying, you know, write a report because they're still trying to learn what a report means. So going into a lesson, you know, you say, okay, well, you have a, you know, write this report. Here's what it looks like. Here are the pieces. Here's option B. And option C might be choosing something else that you think of, but giving them options so you don't force them to try to figure out how to show mastery on their own, but giving them giving them some ways and some demonstration of ways to show mastery. Does that do you, do you see the difference between 
making it so open ended then and then coming to a lesson with options with giving them choice because the other part of that is I talked about how Montessorians love the word choice, which I think kind of like our follow the child, uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, loophole, we always say choice. And so we think that <clears throat> let it do anything is choice. And I also like to point out that also saying you have a choice between A, B, and C, that is also a choice. Mm -hmm. So I think that yeah. we need to be clear. Christine, Christine uh, coins it beautifully guided independence, which is, um, to answer your question, Kathy, um, I always felt in the classrooms I did that structure, um, it's like jazz. You cannot be a jazz musician without understanding the classical structure of music. And that's what um, allows, it was the structure that allows the improvisational work. And so the more structure you have, the greater foundation and support you have for not only the students in your classroom, but for the adults in your classroom. Mm -hmm. I always looked at it because I know, Robin, you did co-teaching and you had assistants. And I mean, we have that dance we're playing as well. <laughs> Because everything, you know, you could be doing a practical life lesson in an upper elementary classroom. It's not called a lesson, but it might be. And while someone else is doing something else. And so how do you structure your day and how do you structure your mornings and your afternoons and then your hour? And then how do you feel good about what you did at the end of the day, I think is really important when you're in a collegial working environment. Yeah, I also, I really appreciate that, Tanya, and I appreciate that Robin um, talked about this, you know, coming coming to a lesson prepared with what is it, your purpose, what's the higher order thinking skills you're doing, that intention, that level of intentionality changes the whole interaction with the student, right? So hopefully you have a really positive relationship with your student, you already have a good rapport, and now you're coming with some intentionality, which means that they're going to feel that. They're not going to feel like this is just a whim. It's just another lesson I have to sit through. Who knows if it's I'm really, you know, this is anything I'm interested in. That teacher already has made connected the dots and helped see that. So really appreciate that. And I want to come back to Renee because Renee, a little while ago, you um, had a comment and we went to, to comments in the chat first. So let's come back to Renee. That's you, Renee. Hey, you're muted. So Robin, I, this is great. I had a couple of thoughts earlier because I remember Michael describing follow the child and I couldn't remember what he had said. And as soon as you said it, I went, I remember that. I remember that. And and I think, Tanya, you just made the comment I was going to make one of the two that, you know, follow the child. Montessori teachers are called guides because they're supposed to guide, right? They're not. They're not called followers. So we used to talk about that a lot at Kingsley in elementary. And I can just share that our elementary teachers, Michael came out and did this training for them. And they loved it for a lot of reasons because they felt like the students picked up from the model. So on the days they might not be getting that many lessons, they knew they had to do their work, right? Because it, it it's a model of the classroom. And they also said that it was helpful to them because sometimes they would find a couple of days that they didn't get to three or four lessons a day. And then they had to stop and say, what's going on in the classroom? I need some help. And the co-teachers would kind of talk about it and say, what, what do you think is getting in the way? And somebody would observe and, and just try to see. Sometimes they would call a class meeting and talk to the students about it because maybe it was an off week. Um, so I think that, you know, that was my point that I wanted to make was that the teachers felt that it was also a good, not really assessment, but a good framework for them to stay on track because there are lots of lessons that you want to present, right? And and I think a last thing I just wrote was that they also felt like they could keep their scope and sequence ordered in their head so much better. So that's my point. But anyway, and I think during the pandemic, Michael did this in a 90 minute workshop because I was his moderator, <laughs> you know, when we were having moderators on the thing and, and it was amazing to watch it. Yeah. 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 What, yeah. So, thank you. Overview. I think your point, I mean, like a word that we haven't used, but I think maybe it's worth like almost is it just helps everybody stay organized. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, we like, you know, again, when I was talking about for students too, 
like I, I mentioned that earlier, it 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 dem like it helps them create a sense of order that mm -hmm. I think most people want. And we as Montessorians, like I, I think that we fight this battle was like, okay, well, if I'm structured, am I really Montessori? Or like, and I, I feel like there are a lot of these battles that exist within Montessori where we're like, well, if I do it this way, you know, then I'm not real a true Montessorian because I'm, and so we have to, we would clarify that it's not it's, it's not to to limit, it's to create order. Um Robin, also the point on that is, you know, predictability um, provides reassurance, it, it builds trust, it helps the student know what the expectations are. So all, all of that, yes, it helps keep the teacher organized, but for the student, it provides safety, emotional safety. I know what to yep. expect, I know what's coming next. And I, I think that we can't underestimate the sort of hidden curriculum of the teacher being predictable. Not not routine, not like, oh, there's no um, there's no give and take. And I don't think you're saying that at all. So um, yeah, I just think that that's a, that predictability part is really important for students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I, I wanna add one thing because I know that we don't have much time, but I think it's important, especially as it's recorded. One of the things that Michael always talked about and actually at the AMS conference, I remember we presented on this and you, I'm sure a lot of you have heard him talk about this. I'm about to say, excuse me. Oh, it's there. Well, he would talk about passion projects and the importance of passion projects and independent work. So while we're still talking about, you know, we want to make sure we get on a schedule for, you know, our language and our geometry. So we're learning, you know, we're, you know, in fourth grade, we're learning about similarity, congruence, and equivalence, and we're working with the plates. And then we get into area and then we get into volume. And that's all important, but also building into your schedule opportunity for passion work. And so what that would look like is, again, providing a framework of what does something like that look like? So if I even said to you all, as however many adults are here, hey, go do your passion work, right? What does that mean? Does that mean like, you know, maybe, I don't know, Tim's out there working with horses, Kathy's writing. A, I mean, it's so open-ended that, that what Michael basically suggested is that you can provide, again, the framework for doing, exploring some of these passions within within a limit of what that looks like. So, you know, what, like what he talked about again was something like, you know, creating time in the afternoon or whenever where you have clear outlines of what they're going to be doing. So using a good Michael example, Shetland ponies. How many of you have heard Michael talk about Shetland ponies? No, yeah. he always used Shetland ponies as his example here. And I'm like, Michael, seriously, a Shetland pony can't like, who it even is that? But Basically, what it might look like is if a child was interested in Shetland ponies, you know, during a specific time, they would be able to explore what, you know, explore Shetland ponies. But think about what is it that their that their end goal is going to be. So if I said to you, OK, we're going to work on you know, we have this month set aside to do passion projects, you know, every Wednesday afternoon. And part of the first piece of this, that framework is what do you want your end product to be? Is it to write a report on a Shetland pony? Is it to create a video? Is it to whatever? But he built in framework for also exploring these non-academic things. But again, it had a framework and it wasn't so open-ended that, you know, they're just percolating, trying to figure out what to do. And I think but that's- doesn't set up for success. So what you've done, what Michael is suggesting is setting the student up for success, providing as much boundary as they need, as much guidance as, as Renee referred to, and letting them go within that framework. Christine, I know you have a comment, go ahead. So just, just real quickly, I, I love what you're talking about there, Robin. And um, we had a student in our elementary classroom at one point who um, had some learning issues and other kinds of issues. His, um, I'm dating this, his passion was the Titanic. And the, the elementary teacher in the classroom knew the scope and sequence so well that she focused on the skills and the concepts rather than the materials. And that child learned how to read. He learned how to do all kinds of math. He learned about weather. He learned about ocean currents. He learned from each part of the lower elementary curriculum, but it was all focused on the Titanic because that was the one spark that we could, get, we could find to connect with this child. And and I think that's a perfect example. And one of the things that Michael would often talk about is, is that 
through these passion projects, it's not that they're doing instead of, you know, a key academic area, area, they're doing it in support of. So to Tim, your point earlier about the importance of reading, right? Like if I'm a kid and I'm not a, I'm not a, if I'm a student and I'm an emerging reader, right? I may not care about reading the, you know, silly books that we have or silly, you know, are uh, reading for comprehensions or, or SRAs. But if I'm reading about something I'm passionate about, I'm going to probably be, become a more proficient reader. So Michael always talked about how do you use, you know, these passion projects and really emphasize the importance of including them because they use different skills. And, and probably most importantly, the, you know, uh, Christine, this is your, your area of expertise, but like giving them the executive function opportunities. So for example, if I'm passionate about the Titanic and I have to start thinking about what do I want to do at the end of this unit? Is it a, you know, is it a, a poster? Is it a report? Do I want, is it simply enough for me to stand up in front of my peers and tell them what I learned? Or if somebody's, if somebody's interested in, you know, homelessness, maybe their end product is an act or creating a fundraiser or whatever it is. So they're thinking about, okay, how do I go from something I'm interested in to some sort of product? And that's one part of it. Chris, Chris, yeah, go for it. Just to finish the story, this little, this young man who um, never really quite felt like he fit in, he did this incredible thing. He came to me and I said, I want to present. And I said, okay, we'll talk to your teacher about it. He said, no, 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 I want to present. What he meant was, and, and he followed through, he planned it. He needed some guidance, but he planned it. He invited every family, every child. We held it at night. He wanted to have refreshments and he chose to have an English tea. He created posters. I mean, that the end project was like, blew everybody away. And it, you know, it's just, it's that, it's, it's that passion, you know, it's, it's how do we connect with that curiosity and still teach everything that you're talking about teaching. Yeah. And again, so all those things were pieces that, you know, Michael, one of the criticisms I'd, I'd call it that many people had for this model was, oh, it's too structured. It doesn't give opportunity for, you know, for freedom and choice. And what I'm trying to suggest is that, yes, it was structured. Yes, it is many things, but it also, you know, provides opportunity for choice and safety and et cetera. And um, yeah, Tim, let me read your, this is a long one. Tim, would you like to unmute and share with us? You're welcome yeah. to do that. I don't know how to get off mute. Oh, you're, you're not mute. muted, so you're fine. We can hear you, go ahead. Oh, you can. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, I, I, I come from, as I say, both Montessori and homeschool backgrounds, plus I've been involved in public schools too. And it, it it just seems to me the the traditional system just takes so long. There are kids that could be moving ahead if they were taught to mastery. And then it, we have public schools here and high schools here in Houston that allow uh, kids who are able to do it uh, also to take dual credit college courses and uh, and so on. And I just think we make things last longer by not teaching to mastery every step of the way. Sal Khan, founder of Khan Academy, has a great uh, YouTube video on this, on going from pre-algebra to algebra, and saying, you know, he, he has he, he emphasizes, you know, teaching to mastery uh, before going on, um, but that needs to start much earlier than what he describes. So anyway, mm -hmm. I, I'm just kind of curious here as to whether or not uh, uh, this is a feature. I've been wondering this because I don't have any experience with Montessori, not much anyway, but not private Montessori secondary schools. Well, I mean, I'll answer. I mean, I think that mastery is an interesting word. And I think for some things, it's easier to observe mastery than others. So for example, if I'm fixing a car and then now it works and it works well, then clearly I've demonstrated mastery. Whereas, you know, for some things like, like if I'm really trying to help, if if one of my goals for my secondary, my secondary student is to really think analytically about a, you know, something happening, for example, in the world, understanding that that what's happening right now, for example, in um, Israel and Palestine is, you know, something that has, 
you know, existed for many years and it's not unique to these two groups of people, but understanding, you know, the underlying reasons and can think critically about what that means about people in the world, you know, that's harder to, to judge in mastery, right? Because it's, it will look different for different people. So to your point, Tim, I think that mastery looks different based on the subject and based on the age. And I think that there are certain things, especially as we're progressing in younger years through the Montessori curriculum, getting, you know, getting to a level of mastery is easier to identify and sometimes even possibly more important. It's kind of like, you know, the metaphor that I always use, and I'm sure all of us here use, is it's like the foundation of a building, right? You don't want to build multiple levels on weak foundation. So you got to have that solid foundation. And that's kind of like mastery, especially at the younger levels. Um, yeah, I did want to, I do want to say one more thing, and I know time is coming. One of the challenges I think for elementary Montessorians, again, as they're organizing curriculum, and I didn't mention this yet, that's why I want to get it in, is the model that Michael used is based on the assumption that, that there are three different uh, courses, or I'm sorry, three different levels in each curricular area that you're teaching three different years. So a first grader will have three different history curricula over the course of those three years. So that is, for many people, very cumbersome and a lot. I mean, that means teaching, you know, getting all the curricular areas and making them three subjects. That is one model. And now, whoever has done CGMS or Tanya, you may be able to speak to this. One of the CGMS model, which is a bit different, teaches, for example, in some areas, it teaches all the students every year. So instead of teaching, for example, cultural, like a, a cultural study teaching three, instead of teaching three different lessons, you're teaching one lesson of the whole group, but you're changing that over the course of three years. Is that, you know, so, so those are two different models and there are benefits to both of those models. Um, but then that's something we'll talk more in the course, but that for many people becomes a much easier model because instead of having to essentially understand, for example, you know, three different lineages of biology, history, geometry, et cetera, I'm doing one, but I'm differentiating the type of work and expectations I ask of the students. And so that's also one of the challenges within Montessori is those are vastly different approaches, would you say? Yes, and I think that it either requires us to do a part two, which we may do, but I think people wanna register for this course. I have put the link in the, uh, in the chat um, a couple of times. And if you need more information, feel free to email me and I'll make sure you have that. And also uh, Christine Lowry has a new course coming out as well. Uh, let's see if I got the title right, Autism, ADHD and Anxiety, Successful Inclusion for Every Montessori Classroom and School, I would go, I would add. <laughs> whole school, I believe in whole school, not, you know, individual uh, Montessori mall where everybody's doing something different. So that co both courses are um, getting ready to start soon. So please pass on those links to people that you know that would be interested, or if you'd like to take it yourself, uh, please do that. I have in our final moments, um, uh, an announcement, Dina Pollock, who's often with us, um, a Montessori and obviously founder of the uh, Dallas Montessori Teacher Education Program. Her husband, Jim, passed away um, a couple of days ago, and yeah. it was really unexpected, and the service is today. So I did want to honor Dina and Jim and all of the work that they have done uh, to educate Montessori teachers over very, very many years. I have... Uh, Put some information here in the chat. If you are interested, please uh, download that. And if you have an opportunity to reach out to Dina, I know she would appreciate it. Uh, so th thank you for that. Um, they've done a lot for Montessori as so many before them have. So we honor that. So Robin, thank you so much. I think you've uh, actually created more questions, but also uh, created a lot of, I, I think for all of us, um, some sense of that we really can do this and it can be done well, and it can be done without raising the student's anxiety, which I feel very, very um, uh, you know, passionate about. That's my passion project is to, to help reduce the stress and anxiety that we're infusing our classrooms and our students with. So. Appreciate all of your time and look forward to the course starting. That will be in October, is that correct? I think so, yep. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but yep. Yep, well, they'll get it if they go to the link. And also, just in case you have not registered for the conference, October 24th through 27th, 
I'm putting that link in there as well. We will be in Atlanta, Georgia. We're very excited, looking forward to that. We've got some special things coming up, including a, a pre-conference leadership day and a day for adult educators. So we're very, very excited about that as well. And a school tour. And I just met with the school tour folks this morning and they're very excited to have us come. So it's a lovely school from infant through high school on a nice piece of property with animals and all kinds of other, uh, I don't know, fun Montessori things that we can all see. So we're looking forward to that. <laughs> and I just put my, um, I put my email there. If anybody has questions about the course or otherwise and wanted to do anything more with this, just please yeah. uh, reach out. Yeah, keep in mind, Robin does coaching and consulting with schools and with teachers, as Lisa had talked about with her teachers, uh, and and um, and Renee had talked about having Michael come before to her school. So uh, yeah. we're all available. If you need any assistance or help, we um, are happy to help. So Robin, again, thanks so much. This was great. Uh, we all learned a lot, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back again soon, and hopefully that course will fill up. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Nice to you all. Thanks for having me. Yep. We'll see everybody in two weeks. We'll be off for Labor Day next week and we'll come back in two weeks. See you then. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.